we've been enjoying hosting these this year. It was a idea that came out through our, our research task team that has been running actually since COVID started, where the deputy deans and a group of us get together uh, on a regular basis and think about how we can um, how we can enable research at UCT and particularly how we can enable research to happen in different and uh, interesting ways. So with Vision 2030 and our focus on the um, on the grant on grand challenges and, uh, and research which has societal impact, um, work, work which happens across faculties is becoming increasingly important. And one of the things we know, we know that working across faculties can be can be quite challenging in UCT from the um, administrative uh, bureaucracy um, space, which we're working on. But also UCT is quite a difficult university to get to meet people from other faculties and, and from other departments and from people who do different things. And so we wanted to work out ways to do that. And you will see we've been working quite hard on it this year with the networking events and so on. One of those ideas was let's let's put things together across the faculties. Let's have short, interesting um, ways of looking into research that gets done on a topic, but by different people. And th that's where this inter interfaculty conversational series came from. Um, I think it's been really interesting for us. Um, and we have, I mean, I've really enjoyed the insights that I've got into different people's work. And I really look forward to, to the today's inputs uh, around women of the world. And it's work, it's being able to um, spark ideas through this kind of initiative that's going to allow us to uh, build our research um, programs and projects in different ways that we can bring different people's expertise to bear on some of these big challenges that we are dealing with um, in, in our country, in our town and in on our continent. Um, and it always when when many years ago I was the founding director of Future Waters, an interdisciplinary research institute, my take was always we were housed in engineering in the built environment and quite a, a and had very good technical group uh, skills. But my take was always we would we would make it or not make it based on the way in which we could bring in the social scientists, the economists and so on to think about the same challenges from different perspectives. And I think that continues to be really important for many of us. Um, and so I'm hoping that today will yet again be a, a, a time where you'll take away something interesting. You'll find out something different that gets done in this university. You'll see some new faces. Um, Meet some new faces. I see a lot of you online today, but it would be nice. It's nice to be able to meet people, um, and 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 so be stimulated into some new form of research. I'm not going to talk for long. I'm handing over to the dean of health sciences, uh, Professor Lionel Green Thompson, um, to kick us off. Thanks. Thanks very much, Sue. I'm, I made notes. I don't ramble all morning. Welcome to the Faculty of Health Sciences in this place that we call the place of the stars. In 1956, 20,000 women marked, marched in the union buildings protesting the extension of pass laws to women. But it took another 38 years before they would be able to exercise the right to vote in 1994. As I think about this, this event as women of the world, and I reflect on that occasion, two things emerge for me as these themes of women of the world converge. There are two points that that, group, that gathering of women made. The first was the conscious decision to draw women from different sectors and different demographic characteristics to carry their petitions into the building on that day. Lillian Masidiba Ngoi, a member of the Garment Work Union would become the first woman elected to the ANC NEC. But a story I didn't know until I looked her up earlier today was that she was arrested because she tried to get onto a ship heading to Switzerland to address a conference without a passport. Rahima Musa was born here in, in Strand in the Western Cape and a woman who became involved in the Transvaal Indian Congress. Sophie Williams de Brain originally from the place we now call Kladecha. She was part of the Textile Workers Union and an organizer of SACTU, the South African Congress of Trade Unions, and, 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 and an organizer for the Colored People's Congress. And then Helen Joseph, who herself was a veteran of the Second World War, 
She became a unionist with the Garment Workers Union when she arrived in South Africa and became a member of what, what was then called the Congress of Democrats, which is effectively the white organization who was represented at the Freedom Charter. In all of their stories, there's a capturing of a sense of the different women who gather today to tell us what they're doing and the opportunities for intersection. The second idea that emerged for me from that march was the idea of Watin Tabafazi, Watin Timbogoto. That call that if you touch the women, you touch a rock is quite a resonant thing as we look at women, as we, 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 we think of their position on, in the world. But particularly, it reflects for us the resistance that those women took up on those journeys towards the union buildings. But today, as I work, I'll come you into this place of the stars, or as the first people who lived in this observatory area called it, Kami Rodi Chais. I'm deeply mindful that in so many ways, the experiences of, of those women are important for us to reflect on, but I'm also recognizing the extent to which both people as stars and stars in the heavens continue to guide the explorations that we may, we may undertake. But I am also deeply mindful that in the 21st century, at this moment in South Africa, women continue to be marginal and continue to be vulnerable in ways that we didn't expect to be the case. I want to recognize the women who are speaking today, but I want to say about this woman of the world that today we're actually reflecting in some ways about a past, the legacy of women in our faculty and within the greater university, our pre present, the eminent role which women occupy now as thinkers in the university, and very often the, the sources of the solutions that we so desperately need for our world. Women continually asserting their presence and amplifying a voice of promise for a future generation. But also to reflect on the future, that future which is promised if we listen with a different sense of compassion, hear the lessons that are being provided in forums like these today with some humility, and openness to changing the course that we may need to take. The women presenting today who offer a completely new vision of a world in which the many voices offer us an opportunity to speak with multiple disciplines together about a future we may not really be imagining quite yet. I do want to honor the, the women by naming them today, Nolundi Luwayo, Luaya, Eleanor Moore, Amita Jagger, Lillian Arts, and Mercy Brown Lutango. What you do for us today is bring together a multidisciplinary discourse that allows us to think about that ever elusive sense of wellness that a faculty of health sciences should be thinking about all the time and recognizing in today's topics that wellness is a manifestation of so many aspects of the way we relate as human beings. So thank you very much for being here. Welcome to our faculty and let's enjoy talking to each other with each other, but most importantly, listening carefully. And I welcome uh, Yolanda, the acting deputy dean for research in our faculty, to say a few words and take over the program. Thank you, Lionel. So Marlon's just going to bring up a few very short slides that I'm going to present to you, really just to give you a feel for research in our faculty and this aspect of interdisciplinarity. Um, I just wanted to say in advance that for the people online, um, the settings are such that you won't be able to um, verbalize directly to us. But as you have thoughts and questions, please do feel free to put them, please do feel free, thank you, to put them in the, um, the Q&A section of the online meeting. And then what will happen is, after I've invited each of our speakers to say a few words to us, um, they'll come up front and we can discuss this aspect of women of the world, the interdisciplinary research that we do, how we can potentially work together in future, how perhaps we could be working together in ways that we hadn't previously thought of. Um, and so please do put your thoughts into the Q&A section um, at any stage during today um, so that we can bring that up during that discussion session. So um, I'm not going to read all this to you because it sounds like a, a little bit of a brochure, but essentially it's just to highlight that, you know, our research in the, the faculty is very much done in the context of the greater university. And it's not just about excellence, it's about being innovative, it's about being relevant, it's about positioning us within South Africa, within the continent of Africa um, and, and within the global setting. So it's about our contribution 
from the tip of Africa to the rest of the world. Um, and we do this in a very interconnected way. So we collaborate both with other academic entities as well as cross-sectorally uh, across the, the, the broader health sector environment in our case, but, but again, beyond the health sector. Um, and all of this is about um, uh, wellness, as Lionel has said, wellness in the, the broad sense of the world, word, not just physical health. Um, and uh, so we do this, especially here at UCT, very much in collaboration with our Western Cape Health Service platform. So um, uh, our researchers work very closely with um, everybody out in the communities in the districts around the Western Cape to try to help ensure that in an engaged way, the work we do stays very, very relevant to our local communities. Our research spans um, a wide range of areas from the basic sciences to the clinical sciences, the allied health sciences, public health, population health, epidemiology, health systems. Um, and we try to encourage collaboration wherever possible with this. And, and, I'll, and I'll give a, a, an example in a moment. Um, and just to say, we do all this very much with our staff working with our students, our postgraduate students and our postdoctoral fellows, as well as our administrative and, and technical staff who, who um, form a key support base for all of our researchers. Just a few stats. Uh, in 2021, we, we produced um, uh, around 1900 research articles. Um, and this kind of research is enabled by, as I mentioned, these support structures um, and facilitatory committees. So we have a number of committees and our ethics and biosafety committees uh, approved over 800 research applications last year. So they're very, very active in ensuring that what we do is ethical and safe. Um, the faculty research committee also helps to facilitate internal funding from either the faculty or the university. Um, but this is seen as pump priming and the majority of our, our income, research income comes from external sources, majority, probably about 85% international. Um, and last year we signed over a thousand research contracts and just a big shout out to the research contracts office at UCT who are very, very patient and helpful um, with us being probably their busiest, their, their biggest client and, and sometimes their stroppiest client. So, so they really are, are brilliant in the way they support us. Um, and this together br brought in uh, last year over 1.5 uh, billion in research contracts. So it's a busy enterprise. Um, and just to say, we also try to um, uh, 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 embrace agility with our researchers, um, um, with them pivoting during the COVID pandemic to immediately try to help the cause there. And, and last year, 159 articles were published specifically in, in the COVID space. Um, we have uh, 37 URC accredited research groupings and also just to recognize many other entities and initiatives that are not uh, formally accredited by UCT's uh, research committee, but, but are recognized in their departments. There are three institutes, 11 centers and 23 units. Um, and just to say, as per, as per the URC guidelines, a, a, an institute um, is supposed to span across disciplines or sub-disciplines. So it really does imply this extensive collaboration and this interdisciplinary working. Um, and the three institutes we have in health sciences here certainly do work in a very interdisciplinary space. They have members that come from other faculties beyond health sciences. Um, and just to say that while this is, is, is a sort of requirement for, for URC accredited institutes, our centers and our units, many of them work in a very interdisciplinary space too. So for example, the Gender Health and Justice Research Unit, who we'll be hearing from today, certainly works in an incredibly interdisciplinary space at unit level. So, so across the board, there's this encouragement of interdisciplinary working. And I thought I would give you one example to close off. Um, and this is uh, an example of a proposal that we submitted less than a month ago um, as UCT uh, in collaboration with seven other co-lead institutions across South Africa. So UCT, Stellenbosch, University of Pretoria, UWC, UKZN, University of Limpopo, University of Fort Hare, and Tafako Magatwa Health Sciences University. Um, and this was in response to a call from the NRF they initially opened it wide. Three um, preliminary proposals were shortlisted. And on receipt of those, the invitation to be one of the three shortlisted invitation, uh, uh, proposals, we reached out to the other two shortlisted groups and said, actually, this is about a national center. We're all bringing in the same experts who work in the space. Why are we trying to write three proposals with the same experts and arguing in competition? Let's come together. They agreed and we went to the NRF and said, can we actually combine and develop this proposal for you of what a national pandemic institute should be? 
They said yes. And sure enough, we then very rapidly in, in the space of two months pulled together a, a very large proposal that very much emphasized the fact that you can't tackle something like a pandemic and prepare for it without working in a completely interdisciplinary way. It is not just about health sciences. So we had a section on pandemic prevention with a focus on early warning systems. This involves mathematical modeling. This involves One Health zoonotics, trying to stop the transmission from animals to humans. It's very complex. Um, there was the epidemiology of endemic and emerging pathogens involving a lot of the genomic surveillance work. Are viruses evolving? What's going to happen? We've seen that uh, happen during the COVID pandemic with some excellent work out of, um, led by Stellenbosch, but in, involving UCT researchers. The preclinical development of timely interventions, be it vaccines, be it medical devices, be it diagnostic tests, be it uh, th therapeutics. Um, the clinical research to actually go and trial out there in the communities with our communities whether something will work. The resilient health systems, because there's no good coming up with a great uh, strategy and your hospitals don't have the beds or don't have the, the staff or don't have the management systems to actually implement it. Um, and then being responsive, uh, helping our communities be responsive to the changes that we're suggesting. There's no point developing a vaccine if nobody's going to take it. We need to understand hesitancy around healthcare, hesitancy around engaging with health service providers, um, we need to understand miscommunication, and disinformation that spread wildly. Um, so there was a, a, a huge lot of work around how do we, we help people um, work with us in, in the face of pandemics. And then we underpinned this with two integrated platforms um, that looked at cross-cutting technologies and that looked at enabling conditions such as legal frameworks, governance systems, etc. The key thing here is there were eight co-lead institutions, but there were also 50 cross-sectoral partners involved in this proposal across the board of a, a huge range of, of different NGOs, government entities, councils, etc., working with us, different government departments in pulling this proposal together. And within UCT, although health sciences was obviously very closely involved, we also had researchers from commerce, from uh, science, from engineering in the built environment and from humanities, it's all as, as um, collaborators on this proposal. So it was a, a great example for us of what can be done when we truly work together. So with that, I'm just going to say welcome to a very interdisciplinary research space. Um, interdisciplinary is the name of the game here, and whether we say cross-disciplinary, interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary, I appreciate those are interpreted and embraced in, in different ways and mean different things. Um, but as a broad term, welcome to an interdisciplinary space. Um, and I look forward to welcoming up our first speaker, who is Nolundi Luwaya. Marlon, if you'll change the slide so long. So, um, Nolundi is the director of the Land and Accountability Center, or LARC, which is based in the um, university's faculty of law. And her research interests include rural women's land rights, land rights under customary law, and methods for understanding and protecting these rights that are informed by the experiences of rural women. Nolindi, please do come up and take us away. Thank you. Uh, hello and good afternoon to all of you, both those who are here in person and who braved the parking wars um, and to those online. Uh, as per uh, the wonderful introduction, uh, my name is Nolundi Luwaya uh, and I come to you from Lark. Um, I struggle a bit with brevity, so I've decided to use images instead of words in the hopes that it stops me from rambling. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a series of maps, uh, which I hope are uh, a useful way or an interesting way at the very least uh, of grappling with the work that Lark does. Uh, before I begin, just to explain, Lark uh, specializes on doing research on the theme and area of customary law. So within the kind of broad scope of various types of law, our focus and specialization is in customary law. Within the kind of body of customary law, we're interested in three particular sub-themes. We're interested in the questions related to land rights. We're interested in questions related to traditional governance. So that's the system of traditional leadership that occurs within customary communities. And we're interested uh, in the ways in which customary law and mining intersect. And so what that means is we're interested in the struggles and challenges faced by communities 
communities uh, who live on land that happens to hold large amounts of natural resources uh, and the experiences of, uh, you know, the extractives industry trying to take advantage of that. And so within sort of those three sub themes, uh, we obviously have an interest in, in the gender dynamics of those themes. And so what I'm going to speak about uh, is the ways in which we are trying to advance and support uh, struggles that are about securing rights and human rights uh, for women. Right, so the first image uh, that you're looking at is a map that shows the native reserves uh, as they were back in 1913. For those of you who are slightly familiar with the South African land story, you'll have heard of the 1913 Land Act. 1913 Land Act sets aside 7% of South Africa's land for natives, black South Africans, uh, and that's a graphic representation of that 7%. The remaining portion of land was allocated to white South Africans. The second image uh, is the one that builds on the first. So the pink or sort of slightly reddish looking areas are that 7%, so the black areas in the previous slide, now supplemented by the green areas that you're seeing. That then is the additional land that was added to the portion set aside for natives. Uh, that was an additional 8%. And that is the kind of cumulatively, both the pink and the green are a representation of the 13% of South African land that was set aside for natives uh, by virtue of both the 1913 and 1936 Land Act. I start with that because it's the grounding framework for the research that we do. We work in areas that are called uh, or were called the former homelands, the former Bantustans. They now make up uh, a part of some of our largely rural provinces, so your Northwest, your Limpopo, uh, your Free State, your KZNs, Eastern Capes. The reason why I start with this as a grounding framework is because, of course, our research is about navigating both the present day impacts of this history, but also having a deep understanding of the historical impact of this history. It's important for the type of research work that we're trying to do, and particularly important, uh, we believe, for the challenges faced by women to have an acute understanding of how law was used to construct this very picture that I'm presenting to you. And so the work that we're doing uh, looks both backwards and forwards. Right? So it's about discussing customary law in particular within that historical context of colonialism, apartheid, constructs, uh, misinterpretations, and in some instances, distortions that have sought to undermine the rights, particularly in terms of land, that women might hold in these systems. And so we go into communities with that in mind. This then is a representation of the homelands as at 1986, as they then would have been consolidated. Uh, and again, uh, for those familiar with the South African context, you would know that people who lived in those former homeland areas were considered to be citizens uh, of those particular areas and not citizens of the country as a whole. And so, of course, this had particular implications for the rights of women. What had happened is that women would frequently be the ones uh, living in those homeland areas, and they would have partners husbands, male members of the family who would, uh, you know, sort of um, migrate into white South Africa in search of employment uh, and in search of becoming part of the labor market. What that means is that women were left to carry the burdens of providing for families, providing for children, but also keeping homesteads alive and whole, which also would mean particular types of work in relation to the land. Women when bore the responsibility of agriculture, they bore the responsibility of expanding homesteads. And in that, that particular role, developed particular rights, relationships and understandings of the land, which in our research, we're really, really keen for the law to be able to recognize, read and protect those particular aspects of the ways in which women engage with uh, the land. Um, and we think that that's one of the shortcomings in the South African uh, legal framework at the moment. This then is an image of the forced removals. Again, those who are familiar with the South African story will know that the forced removals were a particularly invidious uh, act of the apartheid state designed to take people from white South Africa and forcibly relocate them into their appropriate homeland areas, right? The idea was one of these tribes, homogenous tribes, where people speak the same language, live the same lifestyle, and therefore should be grouped together geographically. This particular history of forced removals has immense relevance for work related to land rights and the related themes of our research, mainly because, of course, it's a story of immense dislocation people being actively dispossessed, not only of land as a physical attribute, but also of their own histories, uh, their own connections with ancestral uh, links, their own identities, communities that they had chosen to build 
were now actively being ripped apart, separated uh, and forced into this kind of model idea of how people should live. Again, for women, the forced removals were particularly impactful and have a massive kind of uh, legacy effect on the struggles that we find women are grappling with <coughs> even today. This then brings me to our interest around governance uh, and that theme around traditional leadership. This is an image of the traditional councils circa 2010. Traditional councils are a legal institution that is set up by South African laws as the structure of governance in the former homeland areas. It is a structure of governance that is applied to communities that live according to a system of customary law. So you wouldn't find a traditional council in Rondebosch. You wouldn't find one, definitely wouldn't find one in Constantia. You wouldn't find one in Santon, but you'd find it where people abide by a system of customary land rights. What that means in particular uh, is that these structures are therefore set up uh, in a composition, a format, a particular legal format regarding their composition. Traditional councils need to have at least 30% of the members be women. The reality is that many of the traditional councils across rural South Africa don't meet that composition requirement. And so women are not represented on the legally recognized governance structure that supposedly makes decisions related to land, that makes decisions about who benefits from mining activities, that make decisions about uh, custom, spiritual events. Women's voices are not necessarily always being represented as per the requirement in law. And so, of course, it pitches that ever present gap for those of us who do research in the legal field of what the law says on paper and, of course, what happens on the ground. This then uh, is the final slide, I think there might be another one, um, or at least the final image that I wanted to show. Uh, this speaks to uh, the mining component, right? So our interest in how the extractives industry is intersecting with communities that live under customary law. And the reason I'm showing a map uh, that is about tracking levels of poverty and deprivation is because it is the context into which a mining company throws a deal that promises great wealth for the community, job opportunities, better health systems, better schools, better roads, electricity, running water. Um, and it's the context within which people are having to then navigate, trying to defend their rights, whether they are land rights, whether they are rights to be consulted, uh, whether they are rights to consent. They're having to assert those rights in a context of what is quite uh, visibly in this image, very high levels of poverty. And of course, it's difficult in that context to have conversations about, well, actually, we have a right to say no when, you know, the rest of your community might just be hearing, here's an opportunity to change how you live from day to day. And so in a wider context where a community is seeking to perhaps assert rights, there is always a question about what then is the uh, possibility of a woman or a collective of women being able to say, well, actually, I don't want the mining because it means I have to leave uh, or I have to lose my particular garden, or it means us as a collective of women have to lose access to our fields. Uh, how do you assert those kinds of particular rights? How do you assert those kinds of claims in a context where you're grappling with very real poverty, but also the promise uh, of a way out. And so that makes the deny dynamic when it comes to the theme related to mining particularly difficult and contentious. I end then with three questions. <clears throat> they're not the only questions that interest us, but they're at this point the uppermost uh, in my mind and in our mind. We're really interested in understanding what the content and the nature of women's customary land rights is. What is it that women are entitled to claim? How are women making those claims? In what ways, <clears throat> excuse me, in what ways are they asserting and expressing what it is that they believe they are entitled to? How are women using the power that they have around particular relationships to land in order to make claims, carve out space, make sure that their voices are heard? We're also interested, of course, in the impact of the type of powers that we see our state giving to traditional authorities. It's very unfortunate that the laws as they currently stand really take this approach that a traditional leader, a traditional authority speaks on behalf of the whole collective. We know that even in the best circumstances, whether it's you know, a body corporate or uh, you know, a board, it's not possible to claim that one individual can speak absolutely with absolute certainty on behalf of many other individuals who hold an array of rights. 
Of course, for us, this also goes contrary to what we believe is the ethos of customary law and customary legal systems, which is an ethos of collectivity, one that is about ensuring that there's space for all voices to be heard. And so we're particularly interested in what the types of powers that traditional authorities are being given, uh, what the impact of those powers are, and of course, most uh, centrally, what it means for women, what opportunities might be shut down, uh, and in the worst scenarios, what rights might be contravened. The third question, of course, uh, is the big one. It's the one about what's at stake. What is at stake if we don't address these issues? What is at stake if we don't uh, develop a system of customary law that responds and honors uh, to the Constitution, right? The promises that are made in the Constitution, the guarantees that are asserted there, this idea that for all South Africans, the Constitution should apply equitably, that everybody should be entitled to the same protections. If we don't do the work of developing a customary legal system that honors that particular promise, our sense is very much that we would be committing ourselves to an experience of very uh, divisive citizenship, of unequal citizenship, that for those who are located purely by an accident of geography in areas that aren't uh, well serviced, whether it's by local government or by their customary system, that their experience of citizenship would be unequal. We also, of course, are concerned about what it means for women as part of the citizenship women as citizens, uh, women as a, a portion, a particular powerful portion of the citizenship, uh, and how it is that one can navigate and make sure that they have access to the constitutional protections that are guaranteed, but also that they have a customary legal system that doesn't seek to uh, you know, undermine their rights, but rather that seeks uh, to endorse them and to provide them with support. And so I'm going to leave it there in the interests of being brief, uh, but I look forward to further engagement. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Nalundi. And what we're going to do is, is hold the questions for now and incorporate them all at the end as part of the broader discussion session and move straight on to our next speaker who will be speaking to us online from Europe. I think it's, is it uh, the Netherlands, Elena? No, it's, it's Glasgow now. And I'm coming oh, okay. back tonight. Can't wait. <laughs> Great. Um, so I'm going to share my slides. Elena is going to be presenting to us from there. Are, are you happy to share? Are you good? Yeah, I've done so. Can you see it? Yes, we can. Great. And okay. just to introduce I'm, Elena yeah. to all of you, um, she's in the Department of Sociology at the Faculty of Humanities and has authored a number of books and chapters and, and journal articles relating to her research interests, which include the field of personal life, kinship, gender, intergenerational, rela intergenerational relations, care, customary, customary law, family law and policy, and feminist theories. And also just to say congratulations because this year Elena was also awarded a Wellcome Trust Career Development uh, Fellowship, which are hugely competitive internationally. So well done, Elena, and we look forward to what you've got to tell us about. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks. Um, and thanks, everybody. Thanks um, to the DBC, to the, de the Dean, the Deputy Dean for inviting us here today. Uh, and thank you for that introduction. So you've actually addressed the first thing that I was going to say. So my name is Elaine. I'm in the sociology department and I work. I've worked in a, a number of issues relating to the sociology of the family more broadly. And today I'm going to focus in on the work I do around intergenerational relationships of care. Simply put, I, we ask the question, who does what for whom in families and why? Elaine, sorry, just just to interrupt you, your slides are not showing again. Are you still sharing them? Yeah, I think so. Is that working? Mm, no, we're seeing you. OK, OK, I'll let me go back. I'll share again. OK, apologies. And they vanished. Um, now it's working. Now is it working? Yes. OK, great. Apologies for that. And if you can so just put a simply, full screen show. Sure, and then let me know if that works. OK. Yes. yes. OK. Thanks again. So simply put, what I'm working on and what I've been working on for several years now is asking questions around who does what for whom and why, particularly in families, but how also do we understand that in terms of the history of the country, in terms of how various social structures determine how these relationships are, are, are experienced. And so in thinking about this talk today and thinking about the challenges faced by and opportunities for women in our world, 
you know, it's a huge question, so one doesn't even know where to begin. So what I'm going to focus on, I'm going to focus on one example that takes us through one of the most Im imminent concerns regarding care and families. That's going to be a key concern for the next two, three, four, several decades that I'm sure many folks of the health faculty are, are tackling themselves. But currently where my research lies. So there are many key issues that arise when we ask the question in our context, what happens when the caregiver, most notably older women, when they require care themselves? We know that caregivers always need care. We all need care. But what happens when the caregiver can no longer provide the practical caregiving that they've been giving for over several crises and many decades, and instead that they require practical care support. So here what I what you see in front of you is what's called a family kinship diagram. Everybody in the inside the red line, if you can see that, I hope the lighting is good. Everybody inside the red line lives in the one household. They're connected to many people outside of the red line, some of whom are depicted in this diagram. At the very top are the maternal grandparents who are deceased. At the next level is the older person, Joyce. If you can see that, she's 71. She has diabetes and she had a stroke last year. She now requires full-time care. At the next level is Zandile, who's 40 years old. She's a nurse. She's a primary carer and income earner in this household. She's the only one of her adult siblings who live with the older mother, Joyce. She moved back into the house after Joyce had a stroke. At the fourth level are all the younger generation. They're all the, the people in these boxes are children or young adult children who are fully depend on, dependent. Now, when Zandila moved back into that household, she not only took on the primary care of her old mother, but she also took on the responsibilities of the younger dependents who Joyce, the older mother, could no longer look after. Now, in order to balance all of these care responsibilities with her existing employment as a nurse, she asked her cousin to come along to help. She pays her cousin for this work. Now, the concern is that this type of family care is not new. It's not unique. It's not probably the worst of situations at all in any respect. The problem is it's not documented. It's not understood. It's not sociolo sociologically theorized and it's definitely not supported. So health and state systems are not prepared for the rapidly aging population and increase in non-communicable disease rates that's happening in the region. There's no elder care provision. There's a very limited range of social protection that supports care. Each and already where pers older persons are heavily dependent on family care. If we don't develop a sociological understanding of what exactly is going on in families in these different contexts, we're not gonna be able to support our aging populations. So what I've been doing over the last several years is I've been looking at an intergenerational relations of care study in South Africa. It's a mixed method study. It takes place in, in, in Cape Town and Johannesburg. And really the focus arose um, honing in on um, the care of older persons has arisen from this previous research that I've been undertaking. And what we're looking at in these in, 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 in these families are we're thinking about the various flows of support, the various forms of interdependencies that happen over time, over space, within households, across households. So we can get a sense of the, the multiple care contexts that exist in families. I, I've highlighted a care need that an older person who's had a stroke requires, but the need for that care needs to be understood in that broader family kinship kind of network of flows of support. It also needs to be understood in thinking about how has the state supported this? How has the past and the historical oppression, the gendered and racialized oppression of most of the country, how has that shaped the care practices of today? And so these are some of the questions that I ask in, our, in my work. Needless to say, care became very evident during the recent COVID-19 pandemic and the willful neglect of the state in supporting both young persons, older persons was became very evident. So I look at the kind of the, the understanding families, the history of the care regime, what's happening as, as South Africa moved into a post-independent kind of democracy, what happened to the social protection systems in the, those moments. But not only that, given the way in which social protection is, is shaped, what are the intended or unintended consequences of that for families? 
And what is the kind of how does it create a very gendered responsibility of practical care, but ever increasingly a very gendered story of the financing of care? So there's been four kind of conceptual or theoretical contributions that this work has made. The fourth one being the kind of the current work that I'm working on. The first one has looked at the hybrid care regime, what we've classified. The questions around what did the state do and what did the state prioritize as it moved in the transition to democracy? The, the focus on individuals and the focus on state transfers, what's applauded by many, had many kind of other consequences. So whilst it gave some opportunities to some and it gave grants to some people, it very much focused on individuals, the same individuals who are embedded in, in, in very rich kinship networks. And so what we see happening across that period is we see huge discourses of tradition, families and interdependence colliding with some of the discourses of rights, individuality and econo economic independence. Now, moving on from there, my work looks at the ways in which the social protection system has several unintended consequences. So where social grants put resources largely in the hands of women and the elderly for, for, for very uh, rational reasons on the one hand, what it does when it filters down to families and households is it creates a huge amount of tensions about who's getting what, why and who is seen as deserving. And how does that shape existing hierarchies that did exist within that family structure before? So there we have a special issue in critical social policy that talks about that across a range of types of social grants and a range of types of families. The other work that I've been working on is thinking around a kind of a new concept of the financing of care or what's been called the financing of social Production. So whilst we know women on the whole do eight times more care work than men, what's increasingly become evident is that women are also a particularly black African women. Are, what does that mean for people like Zandila, who I just introduced, and, and, and Joyce, the older mother, when ever increasingly many of our households are, 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 are categorised by female dominated households, which are larger, have more dependence and quite significant care responsibilities. So the new part of work that I'm working on at the moment is asking the question around older persons specifically. Who cares for the caregiver when the caregiver needs care? And what has that impact on transformation, particularly gendered and racialized transformation goals? So what we did with a, a fairly small GCRF networking grant that I got about three years ago is we created a care network of care of older persons in Southern Africa. And so we, what we could see happening, <coughs> excuse my voice, what we could see happening is we could see that there were several researchers and other stakeholders working on care of older persons, but they were spread very thinly across the region, often located in specific disciplines, specific countries, and not always working together. So we wanted to bring isolated academics, scholars, policymakers, government officials into a more coherent community and body of work. And so the grant kind of facilitated that. We've had many workshops, several keynotes, symposia, et cetera, et cetera, things that we're all aware of here. And we've developed very strong relationships with folks in the AU and the UN, but also with our own government officials at DSD and beyond. We have a special issue forthcoming on family caregiving of older persons. But this actual network also provided the basis of what Yolanda has already introduced of a recent grant that I was awarded, the Wellcome Trust Career Development Award. And what this what this award is going to do, it's and to examine family care of older persons in four countries across the region, given the differences in socio-cultural, economic and political contexts. And then most importantly, the programme will be a collective, collaborative endeavour between community members, government officials, both local and regional, NGOs and also academics ourselves. And we want, we know that each stakeholder has an intimate knowledge of their field, society, culture, organisation, and sharing that knowledge and expertise strengthens how we can better support families. So what we want to do in five years time, we want to be on par and be taken seriously by other disciplines, by the economists, by the health practitioners, not saying, not saying that we're not taken seriously at the moment, but currently our evidence base of what happens in families is actually quite scant, particularly in this area of caring for older persons. So in five years time, we want to have identified the challenges of the over-reliance on family care for the well-being of older persons and caregivers. We want to be an integral part in the policy-making pro pro uh, process. 
But we also want to meaningfully embed ourselves and so, as social scientists in multidisciplinary teams working on care in older persons. So we want to be talking with, not just talking, working with health economists, pension specialists, social workers, and other medical and health professionals to really support families in this area. So I'll leave you with that and a list of several of the pieces that I've been working on over the last six or seven years, where some of the things that I've talked about today are featured. Thank you. Um, I know you're, you're kind of in transit at the moment and moving. Um, if you are able to dial in and join us for the discussion session, that would be great. But uh, thank you very, very much for your talk. I'm going to move straight on to our next speaker who is Amita Jaga, who will um, be uh, speaking to us from the Faculty of Commerce. So um, Amita is in the School of Management Studies and is also the Deputy Dean of Transformation and Inclusion in the Commerce Faculty. She's an NRF rated scientist and a non-resident fellow at the Hutchins Center for African and African American Research at Harvard. Um, and her research fo focus deals with the geopolitics of knowledge production and a, um, a gendered and social class analysis of work family concerns. Thank you, Amita. Thank you very much, everyone, and thank you to Faculty of Health Sciences for um, having me share some of my research with you today on women, work and family. Um, I'm a work family scholar, and what that means is that I'm curious about uh, the interface between paid work and family responsibilities. In particular, I'm interested in low income mothers experiences at this nexus and how the geopolitics of knowledge production and knowledge dissemination affects our responses um, to improve the quality of life for women in equitable ways. Being located in South Africa and being aware of some of the local realities of low-income women um, from working from there with them on, on women's concerns has allowed me to, to recognize or realize that some of our pro-feminist policies um, miss these women completely. And northern framings of concepts such as, like we've seen with Elena's talk, on family and what it means to be a breadwinner are ac don't accurately represent these women. So my work tries to explore new ways of understanding work family questions, particularly on motherhood. Um, and for me, praxis is important. Um, so my work seeks to purposefully uh, promote equitable policy and also to make a difference in people's lives. So I'm going to very briefly share three projects of mine. Um, the first is on advancing support for uh, breastfeeding among working women. Um, this is an ongoing project that began in about 2017 and funded by the NRF. Um, in South Africa, maternity and employment policies are progressive. Um, for example, there's legislated breastfeeding breaks, yet at the same time, they fail to often affect low-income women's lives. Um, I initially started this research quite naively against the backdrop of low breastfeeding rates in South Africa. And so what I really wanted to do was how do we ask sort of how do we increase breastfeeding rates among low-income mothers? Um, but through the research process, I began realizing that the good intentions of policy, such as breastfeeding at work and UIF during maternity leave, do not consider low-income women's lived and daily struggles and can actually further exacerbate these inequalities and injustices. So while the World Health Organization's recommendation is six months exclusive breastfeeding for optimal infant and maternal health, the breast is best discourse if not incorporated with a very careful account of material realities of low-income mothers, may be unrealistic and ultimately place constrained choices on women between breastfeeding and working. So this critique, of course, is not with the breast is best discourse itself, since its intentions is to support infant and mother health. But this issue is how this discourse hegemonically informs policy. Um, in a country where the social fabric of what is possible does not really reflect the context um, in which this discourse has been uh, predominantly formed. So we discovered these tensions in a collaborative project on working with low-income um, mothers in Cape Town in general in the first year, and then for the next two years together with SACTU in clothing factories. 
And what we noticed is that these women's realities places breastfeeding as less of a priority for them and a choice that is not always in their control. For example, the UAF contributions during maternity leave were too low for many of these women to survive, so they returned to work a few weeks after having their babies. Accessing the UIF is even more difficult for women with lower levels of literacy because of these very complicated forms. Those who depend on public transport, which is unreliable and costly, to get to labor departments. Those who cannot afford to utilize third party agencies to process these fund claims. Many of the women also weren't aware of the rights to breastfeeding or expressing milk at work and felt that they had limited agency to, to demand these rights, even if they had known. So maternity leave and breastfeeding breaks are then more likely to be enjoyed by middle class women in white collar, better paid jobs. This inequity in access to benefits and several structural inequalities makes combining breastfeeding and working incredibly difficult. And yet low income mothers are often judged as bad mothers when their practices are distant from middle class dominant standards of mothering. So in the course of our research, we reoriented our focus to ask rather how could we best advance workplace and government policies to make it easier for low income mothers and other mothers too to breastfeed at work. In a second project on supporting breastfeeding at work, this time in the Western Cape government, we reflected on who holds knowledge and accordingly we used a human centered design approach to understand the challenge better of combining breastfeeding and employment. With mothers and with senior managers in two government departments um, in the Western Cape, we refined the research question iteratively as we gained an in more in-depth knowledge of this challenge. Interestingly, even in a government context, many women and many managers weren't aware of their um, legislated rights to breastfeeding breaks at work. This project led us to findings that the first line supervisor of the mother can be a key catalyst in advancing support for um, breastfeeding and employment, that the support needed to be communicated to mothers well in advance of them taking maternity leave because many mothers give up breastfeeding during maternity leave in preparation to return to work. That many managers had never thought about infant feeding when a mother returns to work, despite the fact that many of them themselves were parents and that those supervisors who were even happy to support mothers now that they understood sort of the challenge a bit better, still did not know how they should do that or how they could do that. So my PhD student Bongekile Mabaso, who's co-supervised by Tanya Doherty, then continued this work focusing specifically on first line supervisors um, support to offer family support um, in this particular context. Her work was among teachers as mothers and principals as supervisors um, in public schools. And this work showed us that there was a variety of ways in which family supportive supervision may manifest and be accessed that was intimately grounded in contextual specificities. So for example, in Quintal One schools, they continue to lack resources such as a staff room, which places um, more complexity on a, a principal trying to help a mother to breastfeed at work or express milk at work. For these teachers, from these teachers, we also found that gender-based violence and the exposure of these women to these attacks compromises their access. So they didn't want to ask male, super, uh, male principals um, because the conversation, because breasts are sexualized and the conversation might bring on sort of all sorts of different, they weren't sure sort of how it would, would be, be taken. Um, and so this was even in context where principals themselves were very happy to provide the support. So together, these bodies of work on breastfeeding and in the workplace um, has been translated into some policy shifts in expanding the range of supports needed to combine breastfeeding and employment beyond legislation. And I think its strength has been in emphasizing the local context and in co-creating these solutions. So with that in mind, my third project is focused on co-creating sustainable pathways for low-income mothers' quality of life I drew on learnings from this breastfeeding project and the dangers of universal policy and saw parallels during COVID-19 in the health guidelines of lockdowns and social distancing. 
guidelines that assumed, as Elena said, individuality, choice, economic independence, collides with discourses of independence, solidarity, and poverty. So the gender and class neutral guidelines during COVID, which most affected vulnerable women's capacity to work and care, needed adaptations to, to local situations with a situated understanding and centering local communities' knowledges. Through then conceptually unpacking the disproportionate effects of the lockdown on low-income women in the global south and leaning on NIDSCRAM's findings on the impact of the pandemic on women, it seemed that the connections between low-income mothers' vulnerabilities rather than the vulnerabilities themselves were not yet well understood by policymakers, especially from the perspective of these low-income women. And so with that, it led to the development of an empirical pilot study, which is now funded by UCT Grand Challenges Pilot and will begin soon. Um, we will be using photo voice to center low-income women's agency in the development of their own ideas of what is possible solutions to these missing connections between food and economic insecurity, their care work demands, and their mental well-being. The women will share their findings with our study partners, uh, Flourish, which is a project of the Grow Grape campaign, and the Western Cape Government Policy and Strategy to improve equitable and sustainable policy and promotion programs. So while major changes in these spaces are difficult, my project takes a view on what is possible while being informed by the optimism of Southern and decolonial theories that things can be better addressed, especially when those most affected are included in research and policy considerations. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anita. And we'll um, move straight on to our fourth speaker, um, who is Professor Lillian Arts. Uh, Lily is the Director of the Gender, Health and Justice Research Unit uh, in the Faculty of Health Sciences. She has published extensively on domestic violence, sexual offences, incarcerated women and women's rights to freedom and security in Africa. She's worked as a technical consultant to a wide range of national human rights institutions, international development agencies and justice systems on law and policy reform in Southern, Central and East Africa. Thank you, Lily. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I actually feel quite honored to be here today uh, and um, there are many reasons for this and I think that'll sort of play out and become more apparent as my presentation unfolds. Um, today I'm not going to surface a particular project that we've worked on at the unit, uh, but rather discuss my experiences as an interdisciplinary African-based um, researcher on the African continent that is focused on gender-based violence and violence prevention more broadly. I've been a soft funded or grant supported researcher for my entire career at UCT since about the mid 90s. Um, and over this time, I've seen many things change quite positively at the university uh, as it pertains to interdisciplinary research. Um, I've seen uh, changes in terms of how we approach research, ethics, advocacy, social responsiveness, and how we understand research impact. And these shifts have been quite dramatic. Um, and lately more the active promotion uh, and support of interdisciplinary research and practices at UCT, which DVC Harrison has um, introduced in her introduction. Uh, we've come a long way. Uh, we still need to fix certain things in terms of interdisciplinary teaching, course codes and the teaching platform to ensure that our research and interdisciplinary scholarship is really integrated. Um, but I want to start my journey about a recollection that I had when I started out as a young researcher uh, at UCT. And I remember in my early years being told, and this is, was not just by one um, person or colleague, that the participative approach to research was too invested in the perspectives of study populations that social action research was excessively subjective, that it lacked rigor, that it was unscientific, and that advocacy had no place in an academic institution and I was better positioned than an NGO. And I'm really glad I ignored this advice. 
Um, I'm grateful, of course, that both attitudes and, and methods and approaches to research and all forms of qualitative research in particular um, around evidence-led advocacy and social responsiveness have shifted at UCT. Um, and it's come quite a long way from the positive frameworks that I sort of cut my teeth on in the early chapters of my career. The presentations that you've heard today are testament of the creativity and the power of women in science and how this work impacts theory, pedagogies, and the world outside of the university. So I'm going to share with you in the few minutes that I have to do so my journey as a feminist and interdisciplinary scholar who's had the great honor of working throughout Africa. It's a fairly disorganized journey, uh, but I've learned that while intentionality and in career development is important, so too is chaos, opportunity, responsivity, and chance. And despite the ever-shifting research landscape and the complexities that come with it, the pressures of ensuring sustainability of research and research units, not to mention the tenuousness of global funding, I, have not, I would not have done this any differently. So this slide um, shows my research trajectory over the years. Um, it gradually took me from a sole focus on violence against women and girl children uh, to the prevention of violence uh, across a number of key populations, regions, and contexts. This happened over a 25-year period and very gradually. The arrow on the left shows the movement of disciplinary focus from one subject matter to the next. The arrow on the right shows how it really happened. <laughs> the research was reactive. It was responsive to the geopolitical concerns of the country and other countries. And it was also much less deliberate in that the work was also driven by calls for proposals and therefore global priorities that drove local ones. Regardless of global funding influences, the questions left hanging from one study always led to another. And the people and organizations I've met along the way have become important partners and allies in the violence prevention field. The move to the Faculty of Health Sciences in particular many years ago opened up conversations, methods and partnerships that opened my eyes to the hard realities of those working within a wide range of health settings and structures. There are extraordinary people here in this faculty doing life-changing research and interventions, and I take my hat off to those outstanding clinicians and scientists who I continue to learn from. There have been key learning moments where my perspectives, my methods, and my research collaborators have changed and gained momentum. Each partnership developed into another range of partnerships, and most of them have endured. And some of my tenacious and hard-held beliefs, probably in my 20s, and uncontested assumptions were even challenged by my own data and the compelling empirical work of others, which shifted the course and the future of research. Um, there are people and organizations and regions and subject matters that I never thought I would work on or work with. Um, but perspectives and professional alliances change over the course of time. They mature, agendas coalesce, skills become more advanced and more harmonized. Historical disharmonies and boundaries of research within an interdisciplinary space shift and tangle, but uh, bring to light issues and approaches not previously explored. So there's something to say about the chaos of the research world that brings opportunity. I've engaged in research uh, seemingly irrelevant in terms of the broader human rights um, arena, which after a number of years and waiting not so patiently and sometimes more patiently, had sudden national and sometimes regional impact. For example, uh, one small study that we conducted with an NGO that focused on crime prevention in schools manifested into a survey of national prevalence of child abuse and maltreatment, the first of its kind in South Africa. This raised further questions about the intersections of gender-based violence and violence against children, the broader burden of disease, as well as participation in global partnerships on gender-based violence prevention. Along the way, important research partnerships with other UCT colleagues developed and flourished, such as that with Professor Kathy Ward from the Department of Psychology and Professor Shanaz Matthews at the Children's Institute, who are both phenomenal researchers and also women in the world. Of course, there are many others at UCT that deserve this mention. Stemming from another qualitative study that we undertook on the experiences of women in prison, it was a tiny study conducted in two prisons. 
uh, also manifested into other collaborative projects, one being a national study which reviewed the cases of hundreds of women who were referred for psychosocial, psycholegal evaluation in forensic facilities across the country. Then to another project which found us in six African post-conflict African states, focusing on the prevention of violence and torture in places of detention. And this year it circled back to something quite phenomenal. Um, we've been working with the um, South African Human Rights Commission on the Bangkok rules, and these rules specifically focus on the treatment of um, women and detained who are detained, incarcerated, or institutionalized, and we're domesticating those international norms within our prisons in South Africa, um, and we hope that this will um, be launched next year. The approach. Um, I think I can safely describe the Gender Health and Justice Unit as being uh, an interdisciplinary one. Um, it's collaborative, it's developmental, um, and by developmental, I mean that we always try to really understand the weaknesses and limitations of our existing research. Um, we try to answer some of the questions that weren't answered in that research and to put forward recommendations for future research. Now, we haven't always been successful in, in launching one study from another, um, but we have certainly tried to promote the interventions on the basis of those recommendations. The unit also has no disciplinary boundaries. We have or have had research from disciplines from medicine, law, anthropology, public health, pathology, psychology, and so on. Our researchers are very responsive to issues du jour, um, which has held some criticism in terms of being reactive to the existing geopolitical climate. Um, but we also find ourselves making substantive reforms in terms of the law reform process. We try hard to ensure that the research is embedded in all of our teaching, training, and capacity building. Uh, we've been part of law reform processes and successfully changed laws for the betterment of, of women and children in South Africa and around um, violence prevention and torture prevention. Um, we've used the research as part of amicus briefs, as expert witnesses and commissions, and we try to get as much traction as we can for, from those research findings. Um, what's been wonderful in this faculty is we've had support for these projects that I always viewed the Faculty of Health Sciences as quite a strictly biomedical space, but over the last decade, I've really seen the emergence of high quality, really socially engaged research, qualitative um, emphasis, and really breaking boundaries around policy development and engagement. Our team has worked all through Africa. It keeps us very busy. Uh, we've worked in conflict zones, post-conflict spaces, such as refugee camps and tra tra transitional states. Um, we approach the work by with the position that the experiences of local communities um, and how they're trying to strive and get through the world are important in terms of how we try to change local policy and interventions. Um, and we work hard to ensure that we advocate on behalf of the communities that we're working with and for. Um, so in terms of the, the funding environment is, is, is a challenge for most funders. The funding pools are getting smaller, they're getting more competitive. Um, there's a necessity, there's a real need for us to be working together uh, across faculty with civil society organizations, with government departments, um, to really make sure that we are covering all of our bases in terms of the research enterprise. And we found that there are really two sources of research. One is the emerging problem, and this is when stakeholders come to you and say, we've identified this concern in this space, in this community, with this policy, and We'd like you to help us unpack that. And then there's the supplied problem, uh, and that's when donors put out a particular terms of reference that you need to, to speak to in terms of um, being an awardee. Um, but whether we do the emerging problem research or the supplied problem, we do try to make sure that there's always an advocacy element, that there's potential for policy and law reform, and of course, any opportunity for education, training, and capacity building. So, like a lot of organizations and units within the Faculty of Health Sciences, we conduct research to try to make a difference. We focus on the communities that we're working with. 
Um, we employ actively participatory and mixed methods research. Um, we try to account for all stakeholder perspectives. Some of those we don't particularly agree with, but we do draw on those experiences and, and inputs. Um, we define interdisciplinarity quite broadly across disciplines, across practices, methodologies, geographies, and spaces. Um, again, we encourage you know, getting involved in the law reform process. Um, we live in a country where um, we, when laws are passed, there are opportunities for oral and written submissions. You can write a one-page submission to a portfolio committee um, and successfully impact on the policy process. And I strongly encourage everybody to get involved with that in terms of your, your fields and domains. We also work closely and try to develop protective mechanisms for human rights defenders, civil society organizations, and national human rights institutions, and help to revision social justice and ensuring two-way knowledge transfers. So this is kind of my um, career identity crisis before you. Um, as a grant-based researcher and trying to sustain research units and sustain researchers, ensure that there's development of researchers over a course of time that a research has traction. Um, you play lots of different roles and you're not just a researcher writing publications, you're building capacity, you're a learner, you're an observer, you engage in advocacy, you're conducting policy law reform developments, you're responding to needs and to specific calls. Um, you are driven sometimes by donor priorities and expectations, your consultants, your technicists, um, and sometimes we'll wear these hats quite successfully and sometimes not so much. But I think there's something in the recognition and just listening to the previous presentations, the people are trying to straddle all of these spaces and hats and responsibilities within research. And sometimes that's not really accounted for uh, in terms of funding and time. And um, so finally, I, I really just want to um, emphasize the importance of coalitions and networks. And those aren't just scientific coalitions, but they're coalitions that emerge from social justice movements, uh, through civil society organizations, um, to build these enduring relationships at every level that you can to inform your research questions, your designs, to check the veracity of your data to knowledge transfer is incredibly important to the kind of socially responsive research enterprise. And we've had enduring relationships from faculty level to uh, global partnerships. Um, some of you who are here from the Faculty of Health Sciences, there is a group called TAG and it's the Trauma and Violence Prevention Advocacy Group. I think there are about 45 uh, people that are part of this um, platform trying to identify common research goals and interventions in a way that we can work on it from a really interdisciplinary way. Um, so I'm just going to end with that and um, just really say uh, to everybody, one of the things that I've uh, loved about being in a chaotic research space is um, knowing that we can find friends at the end of corridors, across hallways, uh, within other departments that there are all of us struggling uh, within this sometimes contested and difficult research space um, and without these partnerships and relationships I don't think anyone else can thrive. So thank you very much. Thank you so much Lily and we're going to move on to our final speaker. Um, so let me invite up Dr. Mercy Brown Otango who's a senior research officer at the African Center for Cities in the Faculty of Engineering in the Built Environment. Uh, she has 20 years of research experience in academia and the NGO sector, and her main research focus is on the creation of sustainable human settlements with particular interest in the management of urban, urban land and the operation of the urban land market. Thank you, Macy. Thank you. Um, hi, everybody. Um, thank you to the Faculty of Health Sciences for this opportunity to be here. Um, so my name is Mercy Brown-Lutango. I work for the African Center for Cities 
um, which is an interdisciplinary research centre, part of the School of Architecture and Planning and Geomatics. I must forget geomatics. <laughs> Um, so today I will be speaking on um, urban violence um, and the intersection with spatial inequalities and how that uh, specifically impacts on women um, and women's freedom and their quality of life. So I am very interested in issues of access to land. And when I started working on urban violence, people asked me, but how do you go from land and land markets to urban violence? And I, of course, could see the connections very clearly with spatial inequality being that missing link. Um, but for others, it wasn't so clear. But I think urban violence is important because it has reached um, unprecedented levels, especially in cities of the global south. Um, and Caroline Moser argues that it is a development constraint that erodes the assets of the poor and affects their livelihoods and well-being. And it imposes great costs um, economically, um, socially, politically, on the state, um, on the economy in terms of time lost due to injuries. But I think poor households in particular bear the brunt of um, the impact of violence and um, trauma, specifically in relation economically, socially, um, psychologically as well. So um, as I was saying, violence is increasing at a fast pace in the developing world, and it is closely related to spatial inequality. And a lot of research has gone into understanding that link between um, urbanization, increased rates of urbanization, growing informality, um, and balance, but there is no causal, causal link that has been proven between these different phenomena. But Maga, Robert Mugger argues that it's not urbanization per se that contributes to violence, but it's rather the rate at which it is happening, um, especially in cities in Africa and in Asia, where the rate of urbanization is happening at a very, very high level. And this um, puts particular pressure on local government in particular to provide the kind of services that people need, access to water, sanitation, housing, and it's especially these kinds of lack of infrastructure, lack of service that contribute to the, um, the incidence of violence and violent crime in these poorly, poorly serviced um, environments especially. So the World Bank argues that it's not just the physical attributes of poor living environments that contribute to violence, um, but it's also the psychosocial impact, so heightened frustration and a sense of exclusion, um, which contribute and creates opportunities for violence to occur. So between, I think, 2014 and 2017, we conducted research um, that looked at the impact of our interventions in the bold environment, so upgrading of informal settlements, how that impacted on the nature and extent of violence. Um, and we looked at um, four different um, upgrading projects, two which were um, full-scale um, upgrading projects, so um, taking people from informal settlements into formal housing. We also looked at a re-blocking project, um, and the re-blocking project is just where um, communities work with an NGO um, to reconfigure the, 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 the site. Um, in that instance, shacks will be um, demolished and um, the whole site layout will be reconfigured in partnership with the community to provide extra spaces, broader um, for moving around, also provide toilets and water taps closer to people's dwellings, for example. We also looked at one of the violence prevention through urban upgrading uh, projects in Monwabisi Park. And yeah, we employed a range of research methods, from in-depth interviews, um, focus group discussions with men and women, um, also crime mapping um, with communities, and also spoke to a range of people, from residents to um, the police, social workers, um, the community policing forum, neighborhood watch, etc., to just get a sense of how this physical intervention in the bold environment um, impacted on people's experiences and perceptions of violence. 
And so what we found was that um, women are disproportionately affected by poor living environments and associated violence in multiple ways and at multiple scales. So from the kind of dwelling scale, household scale, to the community, the broader um, neighborhood, and then of course at the city scale. And the physical attributes of the vault environment, for example, informal settlements and the, just the nature of the vault environment where um, there's a lack of pathways, there's a narrow streets, um, a lack of lighting, a lack of water and sanitation services that, that puts women especially at risk of violence um, and and um, and violent crime. Um, George et al. Um, doing research in Durban in a um, number of informal settlements find that women are particularly, whereas men and women are both impacted negatively by a lack of water and sanitation services specifically, it's women because of our specific needs um, that are were very harshly affected by a lack of services. And they use this um, concept of passive infrastructural violence um, to make sense of the kind of um, inequities that and the kind of um, vulnerabilities that women have in terms of poor act infrastructure services. So there's these vulnerabilities kind of span the public and the private space where in public spaces, women are often constrained in terms of their ability to enjoy and use these public spaces for fear of victimization and fear of, um, of violence. In the home space, um, women are, are affected by domestic violence, for example. But Paula Meth's work also find that um, in informal settlements, for example, because of um, the nature of the building materials that dwellings are constructed from. It's very permeable, it's easy to enter. So single women, for example, are particularly at risk of um, the shacks being broken into at night and then being um, at risk of physical and sexual violence. But conversely, um, we also find that an in, in um, Operating intervention can have an unintentional um, consequence. So, in our work in Freedom Park in uh, Mitchell's Plain, we found that um, there was a shift in the nature of violence from when people lived in shacks um, to when people were um, living in formal houses, where there was a perception of an increase um, in domestic violence because you know it's harder to hear fights through. Um, brick walls rather than through a shack. So people, for example, this, this crime mapping that we did with members of the community, it's not so clear, um, but I think so the map on the left just shows you the incidence of crime that people pointed out to us before upgrading and the map on this side um, shows the, the incidence of crime pointed out after the upgrading intervention. And as you can see, there's an increase in a range of different kind of um, types of violence, but um, just in terms of domestic violence, um, which is these ones here, you can see there's a, a, a much greater increase um, reported or perceived increase reported in domestic violence. And this was um, contributed or um, to an increase in the number of shabines. Um, in the in the housing settlement after upgrading. So just in closing, um, violence is multifaceted in its causes and it, in its manifestations. And the relationship between violence and spatial inequality is complex and therefore requires holistic interdisciplinary and intersectoral approaches to finding appropriate solutions. So the kind of siloed um, and one size fits all approach uh, does not work. Um, I remember when we started working on this topic, we interviewed um, officials in the housing department at the city of Cape Town, at the provincial department. And whenever, every time we spoke to them, they said, but violence is not our, our, our mandate. You have to go and speak to BPUU down the road. And they couldn't grasp the kind of um, relationship between 
the work that they were doing and the services that they were providing and violence. Um, and so towards the end of our project, we actually designed, co-designed a um, a uh, short course for, for municipal officials about mainstream streaming violence prevention in their housing interventions. So yes, we also need to go beyond physical interventions, um, but we need to understand the psychosocial causes and responses um, and how we um, intentionally plan for safety, and which very importantly must include gender as a key focus um, to prevent gender-based violence. Yeah, there's a need for participatory approach, approaches where we involve women and other users of these spaces um, from the beginning, not just at the end, but from the beginning when we design um, these interventions. And yeah, be mindful of inter unintentional in consequences. Thank you, everybody. So thank you very much, Mercy. Marlon, can you? You just move me back onto the, the yeah. um, Q&A. So, so thank you, everyone. We, we're running a little bit over time, but I think um, with lunch as a buffer, we can eat into our eating time a bit and uh, rather use some of that time for discussion. And hopefully the hungry among you will be willing to wait an extra 15 minutes to, to eat something uh, for those of you who are here in person. Um, so what we want to do now is invite uh, questions from the audience, if we can ask maybe our speakers to just come up to the front and then it'll be easier for us to to direct questions um, towards you and you can pass the mic between you if you if uh, multiple members of you have input into um, uh, the questions that that do come through. Um, uh, I see there's already somebody asking to be part of the tag group, which is great. <laughs> So that push worked. For those of you who are online, please do um, put your questions in the, the question and answer um, part and I, I can read them out uh, for you. Um, do we have questions or comments or uh, suggestions for a discussion point for people from people in the room with us? Perhaps I can kick us off with a, a, a question to all of our panel members. So. Something that was clear to me or became clear as I was listening to each of you as a common theme was this feeling from each of you that that you almost needed your research to be relevant and to be translational. And that speaks to the researcher uh, being involved in advocacy, whether directly or indirectly. And I'm curious as to your thoughts on this. I was I was at a, um, a, a meeting, um, a workshop in Italy a few years ago where there was a woman from the US government speaking who decided to step down with the change in the US government because she felt quite strongly about it. And she'd published some rather challenging things about science and, and, and concerns about research being being pushed down, down, down in the rankings. Um, and she said, you know, we have to speak out as scientists, but we're not necessarily comfortable doing that. But if we don't, then the mic is open. And who's going to take that mic and what are they going to say and is it going to be evidence-based so i'm just curious as to your feeling on on what is your role in advocacy and how much of that do you then where you don't feel it is your role bring in the cross-disciplinary partners who you feel will be able to take on that differently in a different way to you yeah that's a that's a tough one i mean we've always um felt that evidence-led advocacy was incredibly important so we try not to deviate from our what our data is telling us and what our core partners are telling us uh, so we, we actually don't have a social media presence and put out commentary if it's not based on our science but there have been moments where we have wanted to speak out about how things are being managed and there again we're, we're employing other people's science to put our our positions forward. Um, there are very contested spaces which in, within the law and policy um, domain where we're accused of being too academic, removed from the reality of people on the ground. So a lot of our advocacy involves ensuring that the voices of the people that we're working with are presenting the issues rather than us because we've published something or have a, you know, to really engage our the communities and partnerships to, to put through those issues, but it can, advocacy can be really a tough space and you have to make some really judicious decisions about the level of advocacy that you're going to engage in. So. 
Um, so yeah, I don't have too much to add here at the moment, but um, just because my field of organizational psychology is one of those traditionally quantitative, um, you know, very positivist paradigm. You you look for the P and you just publish. <laughs> and uh, and um, I think for me, it's been a little bit different. It's about me finding a place of research that would be truer to sort of my value system. And I think once I found that, I'm exploring how to navigate sort of the, the activism. And and so I, I think sort of I try to bring it into spaces when it, where it generally isn't. So we start, we, we co-organizing the Gender Work and Organization Conference um, next year in June. It's the first time it's in Africa and we're making the theme on intellectual activism. So it's about, I think with, with my experience coming from my discipline trajectory, it's been very different to to Lily's because um, it's sort of me trying to take the activism into different spaces through different sort of modes and fora. Um, thanks for that question, Yolandi. Um, so I worked in the NGO sector for a, for a good while and advocacy has always been very important to me and I um, and I think that I've been um, very blessed because I work for a uh, research centre where co-production of knowledge has been the way in which we work. It's part of our research method. It's also our ethos. So we work closely with policy makers, with decision makers, co-produce um, and design research with them also um, with community-based and NGO organizations and NGOs. So in that, that sense, we are bringing all these different partners into our research projects from the beginning. And in that sense, it becomes easier then to win because they've been part of the research to feed that back into policy development processes. So um, yeah, I think that's, that's kind of how we work. Uh, yeah, I wouldn't add too much on, on what's been said, save that I think uh, for me, advocacy helps to balance two challenges, uh, both of which have been mentioned by some of the other presenters. The first is I think advocacy is a useful, but certainly not the only way uh, to offset the challenge of seeming extractivistic, right? This challenge of extractivism. We go into communities, we get what we want, we come back here and we publish and we use it to raise grants, et cetera. And that tension between, uh, you know, being seen to sort of mine communities for knowledge. Uh, I think activism, which kind of places you alongside people's struggles, can be a helpful way to balance that. The second is I think that advocacy can be a helpful balance uh, against this, uh, again, tension, I think, of being an outsider, right? So all of us here are insiders in particular ways, but we're also all outsiders in particular ways. Um, and, you know, I have some things in common with the communities with whom we work, but I also have things completely not in common. And so, again, this idea of sort of solid Solidarity, working with people can, I think, offset and, and be a useful balance uh, to the idea of sort of, you know, being from not within here to study the thing and then leave. Uh, and so that that kind of tension between being an insider and an outsider can sometimes be balanced by working alongside people's struggles. Thank you. I'm opening it back to the audience. Lionel, uh, let me pass you this. So I, I, I really just want to acknowledge the work that you're doing in the different areas and, and Elena's work about family as well. I am unlikely to ever see this collection of speakers from a woman's perspective. I probably have never, and I'm unlikely to do that again. But it is for me, you know, this insider outsider thing that you're talking about in, in, in some of the, the curricular writing about the student's relationship to their knowledge of being inside the knowledge or outside of the knowledge is really quite an important thing in curricular transformation, I think. So I'm trying to work out now what what we do with with this and, and what are what are the things that you're feeling emerging from this conversation are things that myself as a dean should be considering in the construction of conversation. Because um, I mean, we did a women's research conversation in June, which for me was just quite mind blowing in terms of their approach to the question that was asked of them by the by the evening. Give me a sense of your your 
your thing your thinking today i don't know whether you're engaged with each other or not uh, you may not be at all but i can already see that some of the stories some of the threads are linked in in what you're saying what what should we be doing as a faculty and i'm going to limit it to the faculty of health sciences how do we how do we have this conversation again without inviting another disparate group of of women to tell us more interesting things about women. How? Claire's answer. <laughs> <laughs> I think you answered it. Um, uh, okay, I'm happy to take a first stab at that. I, I think one of the things that uh, comes to mind immediately, Prof, is um, you already have a pool of women uh, from a diverse collection of backgrounds, experiences in the faculty, right? Both within uh, your staff body, but also within your student body. And so in some ways, I think it goes to the point that Prof Arts was making um, about improving that connection between the type of research, the types of questions, the types of matters that are being looked into, uh, improving the link between that and what's taught, right? Uh, I can't speak with authority on, on what's happening in FHS, uh, but I know in our faculty, I think we could take some better steps around introducing that diversity of experience. And so to this point that you make about students being inside and outside of you know, the curricula, inside and outside of the knowledge, I think that one of the richest experiences that I've certainly had in my faculty is when I have opportunities to be in conversation about the research with students, right? As we diversify our student body and have students who come from the communities that we're working on, you know, who have a deeper experiential understanding of some of what we're grappling with, I think those conversations are quite an easy way to keep discussions like this going without having to reconvene uh, would probably be my very humble suggestion to you. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't have much more to add, but I think it's about being intentional about how we work together. Um, and that can be, I mean, some of us, Lily, we soft funded researchers. We're always looking to kind of collaborate with people in other departments, in other faculties. So yeah, um, you know, coll collaborating on research projects, application for research funding, um, and yeah, also curriculum development um, and exposing our students to this kind of thinking from, from the get-go um, within undergrad courses, if possible, so that they kind of get used this, to this, this way of thinking when they get to postgraduate level and become researchers. So yeah, I think it's about being intentional and finding those opportunities to collaborate. So for me, I think I'm always surprised how we've got such incredible researchers at UCT and then our research implications that we recommend for everywhere outside UCT. <laughs> and for example, my own breastfeeding at work research in our commerce faculty, I don't even think we've got a breastfeeding room. Um, so it's, you know, it's those very simple things. So I think one place to start is to start at look at what are those recommendations coming out of the research from our own academics in our own sections and departments and faculties and saying, well, how can we implement some of those very practical um, sort of recommendations in our own spaces first? Because often our research is, you know, for government or for policy makers or for NGOs, but, and I'm, I've only really been reflecting on this question since you asked it, so, you know, I think, I suppose it's also putting that responsibility on myself as a researcher and thinking, well, how do we support our postgrad students who have young kids and are trying to juggle um, postgrad studies, working and mothering and trying to breastfeed and trying to do care for sort of um, siblings at the same time, what are we actually doing for them um, given that this is, for example, my research area um, rather than immediately wanting to only work with um, government? I, I think it's correct that there's already a lot happening within the faculty. It's been a, a long time coming. It's been difficult to 
to organize. I mean, TAG is one of those spaces, it's all voluntary. People are coming after they're finished at the hospital and, and coming out of, you know, passion for the work and a new way forward. Um, you know, there's the whole curriculum change that's happening in trying to embed the violence prevention and detection work within that. And we've got researchers working on gender, sexuality, uh, violence prevention, um, sexual and reproductive health rights. And then you just have women in STEM. You have women's specific experience of being scientists and medical practitioners within a space that it can be quite challenging uh, for women. But I do see and have seen moments where people are pursuing and asking the questions. And I think there's going to be a lot of unpacking to do before we can start to build a really solid foundation to try to address things like the curriculum and active movements around gender issues more broadly in the faculty. But it's the seeds have been planted. I'm not discouraged. Very good question. <laughs> um, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm often struck by the same question. So thanks for raising it and I've raised it in many forms and so have many established scientists that are not soft funded uh, within the faculty and it is an ongoing concern. Um, what, what motivates me is that I have incredible emerging scholars and scientists working with me uh, who you know, are poised to be the next generation of, you know, African scholars. And that keeps me thinking not just about, you know, raising funds for salaries, but succession and support and ensuring that that mini infrastructure is available, that they've connected with other people in the faculty through networks and collaborative projects. So when I step away or move sideways <laughs> or in some other direction, that support system is there. So for me, that's the driving force behind it is that there's another generation of scientists coming up next and I've got to put things in place to ensure that they don't have the same sort of sleepless worriness nights about sustainability that I had for for much of my career. And, and part of those skills are teaching skills like jobbing and getting those consultancy gigs when the salary pot's running low and having those networks in government and with donors. And so that kind of, it's not really mentorship, but that collegiality has to be about ensuring that people have access to those networks are able to sustain and that, you know, when the more, I don't mean senior is an age, but when, you know what I mean? The more senior scholars kind of move on that, you know, we're not leaving those scholars on a slippery slope, you know, hanging on by their fingernails. It's my job to ensure that there's some sense of security there. 
Um, but the question of soft funding, and I mean, we were very fortunate. We hit a massive crisis during the pandemic because a lot of our work involves extensive travel and working in community spaces, and we were just stuck. And UCT came to the party and supported some of our salary bill, which was the first ever in my 20 something career at UCT. So we're without that, we we wouldn't have survived. So there's there's moments where we feel like we are being held up and recognized for the work that we're doing. Um, but it's an ongoing conversation. So thanks. Um, yeah, I, that's a difficult <laughs> but important question. I think for me, um, one of the big drawbacks of being soft funded is that, um, you know, it, the kind of work that we do and the way in which we work requires this building of relationships, um, which takes a lot of time. And sometimes when you're on a soft funded research uh, project, you often have find yourself having to move on to the next thing just because that's what's going to pay um, the bulls and it really becomes difficult to sustain those kind of relationships. Um, yeah, which is which is it's very sad sometimes. Um, but I think it's also kind of what sustains me is working in an environment or in a center where we do work in this co-productive kind of way. We do both relationships with decision makers and we do see the impact of our work and it, you know, feeding into these kind of different policy processes. And so I think that kind of keeps us going, I suppose. Um, yeah, I mean, if I could add, we're, we're also completely self-funded and, you know, there are two things I'd add. The one is um, <laughs> university administration can make life difficult. Um, and, you know, for example, uh, one of the things that we were able to do was to uh, explain and convince our funders to provide um, funding which would enable people in rural communities to purchase data so that they could participate in virtual meetings, which became, uh, you know, the, the modus operandi uh, during the pandemic. The issue was that uh, UCT's P-card policy doesn't allow you to purchase over X amount of data in a particular month. And so therefore, <laughs> you know, it becomes impossible to do this one small thing. Um, and I guess the, the challenge, which I think, you know, both Prof Arts and, uh, and Mercy can speak to ad nauseum, is that even after you have busted your but, excuse my language, raising the funds, explaining the need for something, um, it's going to be these small kind of university administration things that are going to trip you up and that can sort of hinder the ability uh, to do the work, you know, and it, and it is. It's expensive work. It's intensive work. I agree with Mercy. It's about building relationships. Um, the other thing that kind of keeps me going is, you know, I do think that it is about uh, contributing towards sort of what is it, the, the kind of the arc of moral justice, right? Um, and uh, and in many respects, I think what uh, makes it possible to kind of keep holding on as a self-funded uh, unit is the belief that um, the work is important and the people with whom you work are important, they matter to you. Um, I agree with Prof Arts, the kind of anxiety of knowing that there are salaries dependent on how well you're able to sweet talk a funder is a lot to carry, um, so maybe a support group is a good idea. Um, so <laughs> but yeah, just this belief that this this has value, you know, not only for the university's own goals and objectives, but also one hopes for the greater society. And, and that does make it possible to kind of, you know, keep going. So uh, thank you very much. I mean, I think there's, you know, there's honest reflections there. And uh, what, what seems to come through very, very strongly is the internal passion for what you do. Um, and I must say, I'm, every time I listen to one of these sessions where we have a group of our researchers speak, I am reminded why everybody works the horrendously long hours they do because it is so important, it's so moving. Um, and this particular session, I think, really, really highlighted very, very strongly the work that's being done across the faculty with you uh, in very, very relevant and, and um, positive way. So, thank you. and, and what I want to do is just say thank you firstly to our speakers because you're, you're the ones we were here for um, and it's been wonderful to hear what you've had to share. Um, secondly, to thank uh, the Dean of the DEC for hosting these events. I think they're um, a, a wonderful a series and an opportunity for people to start thinking and, and connecting. And I do invite anybody in the audience or online to contact the speakers and each other afterwards if you have ideas of how you could potentially work together in the future or just to 
integrate all the topics together. And then to say that I can support both online via the colleague and volunteer in person um, for your support to help us run smoothly. Um, thank you to the organizers for today, Shamim Nabongo Palette, uh, who did all the work in putting this together. Thank you so much, I really appreciate it. Uh, and to our comms team who helped us with the presentation. Um, and uh, we do invite those of you who are here in person to join us for a snack outside. For those of you who are online, sorry, but I hope you can find for lunch. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and yes, thank you so much for, for uh, a very, very enjoyable and stimulating and inspiring event. Thank you very, very much. Stop from the side. Okay,